Pastor James Aladiran leads Prayer Storm, a movement of worship and intercession which equips the church to be in prayer as well as gathering people from across the UK to fast and pray for the nation believe in God for a great spiritual awakening. Since starting in May 2009, Prayer Storm has become a catalytic movement in seeing many catch a heart intercession, starting regular prayer meetings in churches, schools, universities and workplaces. James also worked at the Message Trust, an evangelistic youth movement led by OBE Andy Hawthorne based in Manchester, coordinating the prayer strategy for the movement for seven years and has seen many come to faith. God provide and do miraculous things through the power of prayer. He is passionate about raising up a generation of believers sold out for Jesus, committed to prayer and radical in their pursuit of holiness. James lives in Manchester, UK with his wife, Rebecca, and their children. Church, with a standing ovation, let's welcome Pastor James Aladira. Hello, hello, Accra. I said hello, Accra. Hello, Ghana. You may be seated, you may be seated. <laughs> uh, it's so good to be with you. I wanna thank uh, Reverend Richard for inviting me, because this is a very significant, special time for me, uh, because I am half Nigerian and half Ghanaian. <laughs> and I had to check with my mom, because uh, I haven't been to Ghana in about 30 years. <laughs> so you can work out how old I am now. I'm not going to tell you. Well, I turned 40 this year. So I've not been to Ghana in a long time. And uh, I moved to the UK when I was 17. And so when I received this invitation, my heart was really stirred about coming to Ghana. Now, actually, this is really good for ministers because many of you are pastors in this room. The fact that you receive an invitation does not mean you have to go. I hope you realize that. Because... The person inviting you needs to have jurisdiction in the territory they're in spiritually. Because if you go there and they don't have jurisdiction, especially depending on the type of ministry God's called you to, if it's an apostolic type ministry, then your ministry there will be illegal. And you're open spiritually to attacks of the enemy because you come in in an illegal manner. Are, are you hearing me? <laughs> so invitations are great, but... You know, the favor of God can open doors in your life that God's not opening. So there's, there needs to be discernment of, okay, God, are you sent? Or is this just a great, you're so excited? I'm saying all that to say, I knew from just looking into this ministry that this was somewhere God wanted me to come. And just being here and meeting Reverend Richard, I know he's out there, he's going to be here probably soon. You know, I've just been so blessed by what I've seen so far. So can we just honor the Lord and thank God for what he's done through this ministry. The decades of service, the decades of service. It's amazing. So good. So um, the video probably introduced me a bit, so I don't need to go into all of that. Uh, this session, we're going to be talking about leading a church in prayer. Now, one thing I know about Ghanaians is you do pray. Is that true? I said, one thing I know about Ghanaians is you do pray. Is that true? Yes, yes. yes. So, there are, in fact, in Africa, West Africa, the same with Nigerians, there are all sorts of prayers going on. Uh, but there is prayer that aligns with the heart of God, and there's prayer that's just massaging our flesh and our idolatry. In the West let me just say more in a lot of African settings that I'm exposed to, oftentimes we're doing a lot of prayer. In fact, James 5 says, you know this, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man makes tremendous power available, effective in his working. So there are times when we're generating a lot of power, but it's directed towards selfishness. And God's agenda is supreme. So it's not just the fact that prayer is going on. We need to break down what type of prayer is going on here and is it aligning with God's agenda for the region, for the territory in terms of his purposes because God's will trumps your prayer requests. 
The fact that you want something to happen does not mean God wants it to happen. In fact, oftentimes your will would clash with God's will. And when that happens, do you prevail? But do you know many Christians are praying with the same intensity as though they're convinced what they want is what God wants. And sometimes our idolatry blinds our deception. And deception is a horrible thing because the person deceived does not know their deception. That's why we need the spirit of truth to come and show us how to live right. So I know you guys know how to pray to a, to a certain extent, but I believe the Lord wants to bring clarity as to the type of prayer that he's wanting. Didn't he say my house will be called? What? He didn't say a house of preaching, right? He didn't say a house of worship, right? He didn't say a house of dancing, right? He didn't even say a house of celebration. He didn't say a house of prophecy. It's not that those things are wrong. But the primary identity was, what? A house of prayer. Then he qualifies the type of prayer. A house of prayer for what? Come on, pastors. A house of prayer for all nations. A house of prayer for? What is that? Intercessory prayer. Connected to God's heart. So the type of prayer that identifies the house of God is not my breakthrough. It's not my husband, my car, my money cometh now. Are, are you, <laughs> is anyone alive in this place today? <laughs> I'm not saying those prayers don't have their place, but that is not the primary identity of the house of God. The type of prayer that identifies the true house of God is the prayer that is for the nation, for the nations, for the agenda of God in the territory. So when we break down our prayer meetings in the Nigerian church, in the Ghanaian church, in the African church, we can see that many of our prayers are more focused on us. God's agenda is, in fact, you go to the prayer meeting, all right, now we're going to pray for our personal breakthrough. Anyone wanting breakthrough in finances? The intensity of the prayer is so intense. All right, now we're going to pray for the nation. Intensity goes down. Anyone notice that? <laughs> now we're going to pray for the community. Inten that is showing us that we are full of internal idols. And we're praying our idols. While God's agenda is left unknown. So that's why you could have churches growing in number because the, pre, the message being preached at some churches is servicing people's idols. So they come to the church that's making them feel good about the things. So or maybe this question will help a lot. Does God exist for you or do you exist for him? Are you using God to get to an end result in your mind? Are you submitted to him to use you? So it's not just about praying. We need to qualify the type of prayer. And when you look at the New Testament and you look at the book of Acts, oh my goodness, I lost track of time. Somebody help me out. I know I've got about 45 minutes. So I need to finish just before one. Is that correct? Anyway, someone help me out because I've lost track of time and I didn't tell myself. So what was that? If you look at the New Testament, you look at... Um, the book of Acts, it gives us the blueprint. It gives us God's heart desire, the DNA, the structures, the intentions of God about what the church is supposed to be. Now, we see corporate prayer expressed in the New Testament oftentimes. And the nature of the subject we're dealing with, there is no way we can exhaust this in a few minutes. So we're going to start and see how the Holy Spirit leads us. In the book of Acts, you see probably the first expression of corporate prayer. Someone say corporate prayer. It means a prayer meeting where there's more than one person in and they're coming together to seek God. Because when Jesus was on earth, the disciples didn't really have corporate prayer with him. They watched him pray and they asked him to teach them to pray. And the times when he needed them to pray with him, you know what was happening? They were sleeping. <laughs> so all they did was they were what He was modeling a life of prayer. But even when he died and was resurrected and went to heaven, 
Even when all that happened, the disciples in their lifestyles and in the way they lived, it was clear they hadn't fully caught it. Are you with me? But Jesus still left them with the responsibility and, and the awareness of the fact that they need to gather together to pray. And so the early church getting together to pray, it's kind of quite significant for us to understand the DNA and the culture of those gatherings. Because that would help us to recalibrate ourselves to see how God wants us to structure prayer meetings in the church. So let me explain a few things. The fact that you like to pray does not make you a prayer leader. There are many people that like to pray. You put a microphone in their hand and the prayer meeting crashes. Pastor, Reverend Wilcom understands what I'm talking about here. <laughs> You know what? The early church understood something that we often don't understand. Let me read you just a few uh, uh, quotations from the early parts of the book of Acts. Acts 1.14, they continued in one accord. Acts 2.1, they were in one accord, they were in one place in one accord. Acts 2.46, they continued daily in one accord. Acts 4.24, they raise their voice to God in what? What do you recognize as a common denominator there? What do you recognize there? One accord. So the effectiveness of the corporate prayer meeting is in the unity of the sound and hearts coming from that gathering. It's not just the fact that there's a microphone in the hand of someone and they're gathering together in the call it prayer meeting, the fact that they're gathering does not make the meeting effective. Because have you noticed we're called the body of Christ, not the body of Jesus? Because in the Christ dimension, we have access to a lot more as a body than we do as an individual. So it doesn't matter how anointed a man of God is, he doesn't have it all. And he would never, or she would never have it all. Because God has created us to be interdependent on each other. Your anointing complements my anointing, and we are able to, so we can access the fullness of the Christ dimension and the anointing for this territory when we come together in one accord. Are you hearing me today? Can I get a musician? I want to. I want to give you. So one of the keyboard players. I want you to just play something for me on the keys. Wait, if the musicians are ready, let me know. This one accord dimension is so significant for understanding God's heart for prayer. So the fact that you can pray on your own effectively does not make you a prayer leader. In the same way. The fact that you can sing in your bathroom. <laughs> you can sing in your bathroom, you're making melody, but you're singing off key. But God is okay with it because you're worshiping him from your heart. But that doesn't make you a worship leader. What makes a worship leader is first a worshiper. So they must have a heart to worship. And then on top of that, there must be a leadership dimension to their worship. And what that means is, when they worship, they stir everybody else to do the same thing. So, the worship leader is not there to do your worship for you. Which means the prayer leader is not there to do your prayer for you. One of the signs of a prayer leader is when they grab the mic and begin to pray, they stir prayer in the people. And one of the ways we know prayer is stirred in the people is, see, the more you preach and the more you speak on platforms, 
you start to discern when people are with you or when they're not with you. It's like an intuition. The times you can be preaching, you can tell no one is hearing me here. And the times you can be preaching and you can feel people. See, um, I'm sorry, Reverend Wickham, but American preachers struggle with this, especially American preachers that have preached the law in America. When they move to the UK and they speak to an English audience, English are generally more conservative. <laughs> they're not like, hey amen, come on, come on, come on, preacher. They're, they're just chill. <laughs> and sometimes they are listening and receiving everything, but they're so calm, cool, and collected, you would think they're not with you. So if all you're used to is the yes and amen, if, if that is all you ride on in your preaching, then you're going to think because they're not saying yes and amen, they're not with you. But if you can understand the culture, by the way, not everything in the culture is good. There are also things that can, the, the enemy uses. So you have to discern when it's just the culture and people are responding, but they might not be doing it the American way or the Ghanaian way or the Nigerian way, but there's actually unity already existing. In the, are you hearing me today? So as a leader, you have to develop an intuition and a sensitivity to discern whether the room you're leading is in one accord or not. It, 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 by practice, you start to discern that one accord. So we've got my keyboard. Can you play me the C chord? So that is a basic C chord. In the C chord, you have the C note, right? The E note and the G note. Can you play that together again? That sounds good. Each note in that chord has a unique identity. Each note in that chord has a unique frequency. When he plays it, what makes it sound good is the alignment each note has to the other. The E note is secure in its identity. The E note is not crying out to God saying, Lord, why didn't you make me sound like the C? And the G note is not intimidated that the E note has a different prayer tongue to him. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Can you play that chord again? So when he plays the chord, what you're hearing is a combination of unique notes securing their identity rightly aligned to next, rightly aligned one to the other. Therefore, you have accord. That is the idea of what it means to be in one accord. <laughs> to be in one accord means there is harmony in our sound. It means you're, you're not intimidated by me. I am not intimidated by you. I am secure in my relationship with God just like you are. I recognize you hear from God, I hear from God. But because I'm leading the meeting, I recognize that God may not give me everything. He would disperse things within the body. So I appreciate the body. So you bring your bit, I bring my bit, they bring their bit. And together, we release a sound of prayer that is in one accord. One accord. Now you see why the enemy disrupts our prayer meetings? Because to be in one accord, we have to have right relationship. Some people are going to prayer meetings. Oh, we're going to pray for church. But you've just had an argument with the brother down the, on the other side of the church. You're still mad at him. The lady over here is upset with the usher because the usher was rude to her at the door. The lady over there is jealous of the other lady over there because she's been believing God for a baby and the other one got pregnant. She hasn't and she's been crying out to God. So she's offended and angry at God. The guy over here is upset with the prayer leader because, you know, the, he preached the message last week and he felt like he, he was trying to get to him. The guy over there is jealous of the brother over here because he just received the promotion in church. And he, are you with me? And they all come together and they start to pray in tongues. So what you have there is discord. Can you play me a discordant kind of sound where all the notes are clashing? Do you feel that? You play again. It's like something is, now play me a chord, one accord, like, now play me this chord. 
You see that? It, we're in trouble. There is, there is no, you're, you're not at ease. Are you with me? There is, there is a sense of unsettling. When we come together, thank you very much. When we come together and we don't get to the place of one accord, our sound is discordant. And because it's discordant, our authority is neutralized. So we cannot exercise any significant level of impact in the spiritual atmosphere of the territory we're in because the enemy has sowed discord in our hearts. So it doesn't matter how loud we're praying. It doesn't matter how loud we're shouting. He has already paralyzed our prayers. Don't you remember he says in James 5, confess your sins. What? One to one. No, he didn't say confess your sins to the Lord. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. Of course we confess our sins to the Lord. But the emphasis connected to effective prayer is confessing to one another. In other words, reestablishing a place of alignment with one another in relationship. And that takes humility. And we've heard about humility quite a bit, haven't we? So when we begin to align with one another, it's a lot easier for us as a company to tap into the mind of God and execute it because the enemy is not able to have any room in us. Now listen to this. You might want to write this down. The constitution of our community is more important than the fervency of our prayers. The constitution of our community as a church is more important than the fervency of our prayers. The enemy doesn't like us praying fervently, but he, he can, he, he can, he can uh, paralyze the effectiveness of that fervent praying if the constitution of our community is flawed. Meaning, we can allow envy, jealousy, backbiting, lust, perversion to exist in our company unchallenged. And we're somehow okay with that because we think we're doing what churches do. Every church comes together to pray. Maybe it's Friday night. Okay, we're just going to do our prayer meetings as we normally do. We think we can just carry on with the activity while there are so many loopholes in our armor and the devil is easily able to get in. So one of the jobs of a prayer leader is to be able to mobilize the church to a place of one accord. To mobilize the church to the place of one accord, you have to be self-aware. See, we cannot be an army if you are not a soldier. You cannot mobilize the church to be in one accord if you don't even understand the makeup of your own soul and your own spirit. See, sometimes we're coming together, we're wanting to pray, but you know what it's like? You're in the meeting, but your mind is at the market. We cannot come together to fuse into one if you as an individual don't know how to gather yourself into one. Are you hearing me? Now, many of you pray, so you would appreciate what I'm about to say. The most effective times of prayer is when you as a person, you yourself, you are in one accord. I mean, your body lines up with your soul, lines up with your spirit, and they fuse together. Anyone knows what I'm talking about? When you enter into that mode, you know you are unstoppable. You can, in fact, your physical motion is connected to what you're feeling in the spirit. You're not controlling yourself per se. It's like your physical motion is just giving your spirit ventilation. Anyone knows what I'm talking about here? In those places, you're unstoppable. Why? Because you've entered a place of being one accord in yourself. If you don't know how to enter into a place of being one accord in yourself, how would you get other people to enter into it themselves? And the more you know how to gather yourself, the more when you're leading a prayer meeting, you can tell people are distracted. You can tell people are not with you. You can tell we're not, you can feel some things interfering. You can feel people are discouraged. And see, as a leader, because you can sense that your goal is we need to get to one accord. So as opposed to just carrying on with a prayer, you're, as you're leading, you're praying, Holy Spirit, 
what are the keys to bring us all together? Some people just lead prayer like a machine. They're not even thinking about the people with them. Are you hearing me? They just keep going. They just, and so I'm amazed because I watch some people leap around. I'm thinking, you, you're, you're good with the words you're saying and everything you're releasing, but the congregation is not with you. And it seems like you're not bothered that they're not with you. you that's not leadership. You're not leading anyone. You're just doing your own thing on the platform. You might as well just go home and pray by yourself. Because you're not getting people together. The job of the leader is to get the congregation together to align with heaven's agenda. So constantly, as you're leading, you're also talking to the Lord. Lord, are we really together? Have we, have we aligned with you properly? What are the things we need to deal with? Sometimes you need to start with repentance. Sometimes the Lord might lead you into praise. Sometimes the Lord might lead you to pray specific things that deals with idols that stopping what he really wants to do in the meeting. I don't know. The Holy Spirit is the ultimate intercessor, right? So at the end of the day, we have to lean on him to lead effectively. It's sad to me that there's so much that God wants to achieve with the church in prayer that we miss out on because of our lack of sensitivity, our lack of awareness of what it means to have an effective corporate prayer gathering. Now, being a prayer leader, one of the key things a prayer leader has to be is an intercessor. There is a difference between prayer and intercession. Are you with me? Are you with me? There is a difference between prayer and intercession. Intercession is prayer, but prayer is not always intercession. Oftentimes, prayer falls in the category of petitions and supplications. A prayer leader has to understand the dynamics of intercession. And so, to be able to lead all the people effectively in prayer, you have to have been somewhere in prayer yourself. And this is a pastor's meeting. You know, it's sad. Many pastors outsource the prayer life of the ministry to someone else. You as the pastor are meant to be one of the chief intercessors of the ministry. The job of a pastor is not to just hire an intercessor over here. I don't know if this happens much in the West. Hire someone that can pray. And they're like, okay, you can do all our prayer. We send all our prayer requests to you. See, if, see what part, part of the problem is some of us think there is such a thing as a gift of prayer. If you think there is such a thing as a gift of prayer and you think I have the gift and you don't, then you're going to, be sending me your prayer requests because you think I've got something you don't, so I'm, I'm there to do all your praying for you. Isn't it amazing that most Christians want to be prayed for rather than do praying? So I am not there to do your praying for you. I, your job is not to outsource your prayer requests to the guy or the woman in the church that can do all the praying. No, the job is that you start to stir up the prayer engine within you yourself. You become a house of prayer on your own. Now, I need to qualify that because I do acknowledge that there is an anointing that God places on certain people in leading prayer. I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. What I'm trying to deal with is a mindset that some people have where they, they want to outsource their responsibility to someone else. And because there are lots of pastors in this room, I want to say to you, if you're a pastor and you're more concerned about preaching than praying, you're playing. If you're a pastor, and what you're more concerned about is a performance on a pulpit than what is going on behind the scenes in the spirit, you are actually just messing around, and you have no idea, and actually, you're in danger. Because this is warfare that we're in. You would eventually become a victim of the very thing you feel God's called you to because you're not prepared. A casual approach to prayer and the ministry of intercession, a casual approach to that leads to casualties. And you see, you're in Ghana. I don't need to announce this to you. People in the West, I need to convince them more about the reality of the spirit realm, right? <laughs> in the West, I need to teach people about the spirit realm. And, and 
Help them see that we're not just physical beings. There's a spiritual dimension that's more superior to this realm. But over here, I don't need to convince you of that, right? You're aware the spirit realm is more real than this realm. So listen, you can deceive me and I can deceive you, but angels are watching and demons are watching. We cannot deceive the spirit world. We can shout, we can sing, we can, we can preach. What gives your preaching the power it's meant to have is the life of power, of intercession behind the preaching. Are, are you hearing me? The pastor has to be an intercessor. See, it's all, yeah, I, the, I don't know if this was going on here in Ghana, but this is something that was going on quite a bit in the West, where, uh, you know, some people in the fivefold ministry were saying things like, I am a prophet, I'm not an intercessor, you are the intercessor, you know, and they start to make intercession like the sixth uh, office. <laughs> there is no such office as that. Think about it this way. Jesus is an intercessor. The Holy Ghost is an intercessor. Two-thirds of the Godhead intercede. So God himself does it. That tells you the weight it has in the heart of God. If he himself does it, He's inviting us into a reality he's currently in right now. You know, the temple has three dimensions to it. You have the outer court. You have the um, inner court. And then you have what? The Holy of Holies. What did Jesus say? Ask and you shall receive. What do you say next? Seek and you'll find. What do you say next? Those three things it said, you can liken it to the three dimensions in the temple. The ask is in the outer court. Oftentimes it's focusing on just fleshly needs. What makes us comfortable? The seek is in the inner court. You're seeking the face of God. When you seek the face of God, you cannot miss his heart. Sorry, let me say this. So when you seek the face of God, you cannot miss his mouth. And then the inner court is it's seeking the heart of God. Something really interesting is the inner court is really where we're meant to live from as leaders. Now, if the outer court is the asking realm and the inner court is the seeking realm, then the holy of holies is what? The knocking realm. Now, do you know what is before you enter the holy of holies? The altar of incense. You know what the altar of incense does? It's releasing incense. And incense represents what? The prayers of the saints. So here's how I see it. You will not be admitted into the deeper realms of fellowship with God unless you're smelling like incense. You have to be baptized in the reality of incense. It's not just praying because you're about to preach. It's not just praying because you have a speaking engagement. As the pastor, you have to be the chief intercessor. The level of investment you're putting in your life of prayer has to be beyond the average. And you need to ask the Lord, what kind of deposits are you wanting me to make in the spirit as the lead pastor? Because as a pastor, you cannot, let me say this way, you reproduce after your kind. It doesn't matter whether you heard T.D. Jakes preach or you heard, you know, Pastor Wickham preach, you know, you heard, and you, you got this message over here, this revelation here, this revelation, and you put it all together, and then you have your own sermon. Maybe you add your own revelation to it. That is not what's going to change the people. In fact, if you preach the most amazing message, the people will remain the same if you have not become the message. You become the message, and then when God gives you a voice to preach it, they become what you have already become. Are you hearing me? You can preach anyone else's message, but no one can truly preach that message that you have become. When you become it, it's like God gives you words, and as you speak it, it strikes the people, and those words become spirit and life. It brings recalibrations. It, it kind of erases demonic programming that's gone in their minds. You have no idea because you have become it. So as the pastor, you don't need to teach on prayer for the church to get it. I'm not saying don't teach on it, you teach on it. But because you have become it, even when you're not teaching on it, you're emitting that spirit of intercession. <laughs> see, see, this is why it's important that you live pure. This is why it's important that you live pure. Because some people think, oh, you know what, my secret life, you know, not that important in terms of no one knows what's going on in the secret. But you emit 
you transmit who you are. That's why it's even important who you sit under and who you listen to. Because if I am living in immorality, it doesn't matter if I'm... See, you can be theologically correct and spiritually wrong. It doesn't matter that I'm speaking the right words. Thank God for great theology. But you can be speaking the right words, but operating from a spirit of perversion. And even though your words are right, that is what you're transmitting. It doesn't matter that you speak, you're saying, do not sin, do not live in adultery, but you yourself, you're doing it. Meaning, even though your words are saying that, what you're actually imparting the people with is the life that you live in. So stop trying to hire the intercessor. I'm not saying don't have intercessory brothers and sisters who are leading the prayer. I'm saying, Pastor, you become it. Because what God wants us to have is not just prayer meetings. He wants us to have a prayer culture. I don't know what it's like here in Ghana, but, you know, in, in the West, in Manchester and other parts of the UK, you know, Muslims are taking over. And they're raising up altars. And I often like to, I mean, you should know this. Prayer is powerful, whether you're in the kingdom of light or in the kingdom of darkness. They fast, they pray. So as they engage those altars, things are going on in the realm of the spirit, working against you and the church. They have a prayer culture. We have a prayer meeting. And you want to have territorial authority? When the person in the kingdom of darkness is more submitted to Satan than you are to God, and you think you're going to shift the atmosphere, we're kidding ourselves. So it's not just the meeting of the prayer. Each member of the church has to be trained to be a warrior. But they will not be a warrior if the pastor and the leader is not it. You're just speaking theology and nice words. If you don't become it, you cannot transmit it. And then when you become it and begin to transmit it, as you begin to support other people who have an anointing and leadership, then you begin to help them by modeling good leadership in prayer. I've been to meetings where we're meant to pray for maybe an hour. The pastor comes up. We're meant to pray for an hour, right? Everyone say an hour. The pastor speaks for 45 minutes. And then maybe they might do a worship song for five minutes. And then the last 10 minutes, they do some wimpish prayers. Didn't we agree that we're here to pray for what? So what that says is, oftentimes the leader, if they're uncomfortable with something, spiritual activity such as prayer, they default to their natural gifting to cover up for their spiritual bankruptcy. Sometimes instead of praying, we're singing. Now, don't get me wrong, singing and worship are two different things. Worship and intercession go hand in hand. But there are times, maybe, see, I'm talking from a Western perspective. So I've not been in Ghana and Nigeria long enough to understand what prayer meetings are like. But where I'm coming from, sometimes we use the singing to cover up for the fact that we don't want to pray. So they keep singing. They keep singing. And then we say, let's pray. When we say, let's pray, you can feel the energy and momentum nose dive. It's a sign that you don't have warriors in the room. And that means as a pastor, you have work to do to raise them up as warriors. My 10-year-old son has been raised as a warrior. He prays in tongues for an hour. I'm saying, listen, because of the way the world is getting, I said to my son, How, what kind of parents would I be? <laughs> to put you in front of cartoons, movies, and TV all day when you're being sent into the battlefield. We're going to train you for war here. You're going to pray in tongues for an hour. You're going to pray in the spirit. Oh, dad, I don't feel like it. Well, you're not a feeler. You're a believer. So we are going to learn how to access the realm of faith. Because right here, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And last time I checked, the Bible said, train up a child. Are you hearing me? Train. train. Everyone say train. So when you're training, you heard the previous minister say, even when he was going to the gym, he didn't want to sometimes. But because he had a trainer. What, are, are you with me? 
Get up, we're doing this. Whether you feel like it, whether you don't. Because I'm instilling in you the warrior mindset. In the same way as leaders, you need to train your church to be warriors. And here you begin to fine tune the power that's being generated in the prayer. Because you understand that the house of God is meant to be meeting the needs on the heart of God for a territory. It's not about your agenda. It's his. So when you begin examining a lot of our prayer meetings, based on what I'm seeing right now, what I'm saying, it's sad to say, a lot of our big prayer meetings in Africa that I have been observing and sometimes even joining, oftentimes it's not connected to the agenda of God for a region or territory. We're very much focusing on what we want here and now. We're still in the outer court. We have not been drawn into the deep places. And I'm assuming my time is up, so I'm going to stop. Because I believe this is something that God is wanting to stir up. I could, I could keep going, but I'm going to stop right now. Pastors, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because the heaviest molecule in apostolic Christianity is the intercessory dimension of the church. And the enemy is scared of it. So if he can't stop us from praying, he stops our prayer from being effective. We're not in one accord. If he can't stop us, our prayer from being ineffective and we can be in one accord, he allows us to connect based on idolatry. So we may be in one accord, but we are not shifting the atmosphere in the region. We're very selfish. And so prayer is going on, but it's not really advancing the kingdom. In the West, some people ask me questions like, James, what do you think is going on? You know, Africans, they're praying so much. They're praying so much, but why is that the society is not even changing? I'm, I'm telling you some of the reasons, not all of it, but some of the reasons why with all the prayer being generated, we're not really shifting things in the atmosphere. There's all sorts going on in here that's causing us to be ineffective. You understand with me? Let's pray. This prayer is simple. Pray over yourself. Say, Lord, make me a man of prayer. Make me a woman of prayer. I want to capture your spirit of intercession. I don't just want to have theological ideas that are great. I want to have reality of those ideas in my life. I want to transmit the spirit of intercession. Make me a leader in prayer in my congregation. I don't just want to preach sermons. I want to live it out in such a way that there is an impact everywhere I go, Father. Make me a man of prayer. Make me a woman of prayer. Align me with your agenda for my territory. Burden my heart with what is on your heart. Read me of my idols. Get rid of idolatry in my heart, Holy Ghost. Oh, let the idols of my heart come crashing down in your presence. Just like Dagon fell before the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Deliver me from idolatry. Deliver me from distractions. Deliver me from contaminations. Lord, let this altar be potent in the spirit. Mark us with your spirit. Mark us with your spirit afresh. Shift our perspectives. Align our hearts with your agenda. Hamalayasis. Hayakando Hamana. Jesus, we say we need you. We need you. Build this church in Ghana. Build this church in Africa. Build this church in the nations. We want the emphasis of heaven to be the emphasis of our hearts. Deliver us from materialism. Deliver us. Deliver us from the God of this age that was easily inflicts all sort of distractions on our emotions. Yeah, yeah, we align our minds with you, Jesus. Come on, church, pray some more. Vale hasta kamalanda bos. Randi vesto kamalanda vesis. Abalanda hasos. Kibalande kailos. Libelanda vales. Alayas, Ibala Santos, Ivila Namanlates, Aleayas, Ivila Namondos, Iviala, Iviala Namas, Ayayayayaya. We will be a house of prayer, a house of prayer. This temple is set apart to you, Lord. Have your way, Jesus. Alasan.
a dangerous prayer. I'm going to tell you what we're going to pray before we pray it, in case you don't want to pray it. The prayer is this, Lord, judge every idol in my life. I welcome your judgments yes. on idols in my life now. So if you want to pray that, just lift your hands with me. Say, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I welcome you. I welcome you. To judge. To judge. Every idol. Every idol. I know that which I know and that which I don't know and that which I don't know judge these idols judge me hold on. and make me and make me a house of prayer a house of prayer for the nations for the nations come on lift your voice and in pray in the name right of now. Jesus Hebalandos Hebalandos Come on. 
last prayer, one last prayer focus, and I'm going to hand over to Reverend Richard. As we're praying, I just feel this word that the Lord is wanting to repair altars. But not just, the, 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 the impression I get is not just individual altars, but it's like corporate altars. Many of you are pastors, and the altar in your church, the, 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 the altar of prayer, it needs like a repairing. You know, like Elijah repaired that altar. So I want us to pray this prayer, that just like Elijah repaired the broken altars, as we leave this conference, the enemy is going to regret. <laughs> He is going to regret the day he oppressed us yes. because the altars in our churches are being repaired yes. and fire is coming on those altars. Fire is coming on our altars. So Father, right now in Jesus' name, lift your hands with me. We say in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Every broken altar. Every broken altar. Every corrupted altar. Every corrupted altar. Every corrupted altar. In our churches. In our churches. As a result of this conference, as a result, result of this conference, we are making a declaration. We're making a declaration that there will be a repairing. There will be a repairing. There will be a reordering. There will be a reordering. There will be a realignment of the altars of prayer in our churches. And therefore, and therefore, we welcome. We welcome the fresh. Be